Good morning. Sure is good to hear all the activity and the conversation of this morning. We'll, uh, we'll pause from that just for a little while to attend to why we're here this morning. We'd like to welcome our visitors here. Uh, I see that we have a number visiting. I've met a few of you already and a few of you haven't met yet. So uh, if you would, take a co the uh, card that you'll find in the back of the pew in front of you. Fill it out so that we might have a record of your visit and drop it in the, in the collection plate as it comes by. And please stay around for a few moments after the service so that we might get to, to greet you and know you just a little bit better. It's good to see those visitors. We have a, a lot of visitors here this morning. We have a lot of our own who are not here uh, traveling for the holidays. Our youth group is in Alabama for the uh, exposure camp, and uh, we wish them uh, a good, safe, and profitable trip there as well until they return. We have a few to mention on our sick list. If you would, make sure you get a copy of the bulletin that you'll find on the glass table in the back if you don't already have one. Uh, and remember those that are printed. Brother Hugh Kelly is going to have his surgery. Uh, Ray Cozart is still undergoing treatments, and Sister Rue Pearl as well. Uh, Gail Chapman's father, Edmund Sauls, and Johnny Ray, a former member of Riverdale. And Forest Park, you guys might remember Johnny Ray has been diagnosed with cancer. Also, let's remember the Etheridge's daughter, Kelly. We've been praying for her and her issues with cancer. But also with Sherry, her twin sister has some medical issues, and they're working on diagnosis of that time. So let's remember uh, this Marlene and their, their daughters as well. Also, our brother Ken Baxter uh, is going for his second round of treatment this coming week. So let's remember Ken in our prayers as well. We want to extend our uh, sympathy to the family of Sandra Johnson. This is the sister of Audrey Shaw. This is the aunt of Catherine Kelly as she has passed away yesterday, and that's Sandra Johnson. Let's remember that family in their loss. <clears throat> We'd like to make sure that we welcome our new family, the Pritchetts. If you haven't had an opportunity to meet them, please meet them and greet them after service this morning. We have a number of calendar events that we will mention at the end of service to make sure that we're where we need to be when we need to be there. But for now, let's focus our minds while we're here this morning. Our first song number will be number 118, number 118. If you use a book, you're welcome to turn to that. It should be on the, uh, the wall behind me so we can all look up and sing loudly, sing praises to our God. As we begin this morning, let's take the time to offer a prayer up to our God and our Father. If you would pray with me at this time. Our Holy Father, it's with much thanksgiving that we have to, in our hearts to come together this morning. We pray that as we are in the end of this service that we might lift our voices in song to you our hearts and our minds and our thoughts in prayer. We thank you for the opportunity to observe those benefits and those blessings and those commandments as we gather around the table. We return of our, a portion of our means to you as you've given us the opportunity to listen to your word as is imparted to us this morning. We pray, Heavenly Father, it might edify us but it might convict us and spur us on to be better servants of yours. Most of all, Heavenly Father, we, we thank you for the blessing of being your children as we have the opportunity to worship you in spirit and truth. Please accept our worship that it might be a sweet-smelling aroma lifted up to you. Let us all, as we join in now, it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. Let's begin with a reading from God's Word. The scripture reading this morning will be taken from Colossians, Colossians chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 1 through 7 from the King James Version. Colossians 3, 1 through 7. If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead 
and your life is hid with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify, therefore, your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things spake the wrath of God, cometh on the, on the children of disobedience, in the which ye also walked, so, so time when ye lived in them. Good morning. As we begin our song service, let's know number 118, as was announced. 118. We'll sing the first, second, and last verse. 118. Two hundred and thirty eight. Hymn number two, three, eight.
bow with me please our father and our God in heaven we come father thanking you for this privilege to come before your throne of grace to bring our petitions father and to show you the love and the respect that we have help us father to do so in a manner pleasing in your sight we thank you father for the many blessings you bestow upon us, many, Father, that we sometimes take for granted. We thank you, Father, for Jesus, that you sent him, Father, to stand in our place, to suffer, bleed, and die, and to pay the penalty, Father, for the sins that we commit. We thank you, Father, for your love and for your mercy that you show us daily. And we ask you, Father, right now as we approach you, that you'll look down on us, Father, with an eye of forgiveness for the many times that we turn our back on you. Help us, Father, that we worship today, that we will prostrate ourselves before your throne, recognizing you, Father, as the creator and the sustainer of this universe and all things that are therein. We ask you, Father, to be with the many that have been mentioned ask you to be with many of our congregation, Father, that are traveling to keep them safe and free from hurt, harm, and danger as they travel during this holiday season. Bring them back to us, Father, in safety that we might continue to serve you in this part of your vineyard. We ask your blessings on our children, knowing, Father, the many trials that they face in this world. Father, things of spiritual matter and things of physical. Help us, Father, to not conform to the things that are going on in the world, but to focus our love and attention to you, to keep ourselves abstained from those things that Satan throws in our path. Father, I ask you to be with each one that will stand before you this morning. Help us, Father, to humble our hearts, to focus our minds on thee, that our worship might be found faithful in your sight. We ask you, Father, to be with many that are going through cancer treatments. And we pray, Father, for the success of those treatments, that that cancer would be removed from their bodies. We ask you to be, Father, with those that are contemplating surgeries, that those surgeries will be successful and that their bodies will be healed. We ask you, Father, to be with many that are casting the hope of salvation away And we pray, Father, that something might be said or done to call them to think along this life. That, Father, they too can be saved and to spend eternity in heaven with you. Help us, Father, to live our lives so that we might be found faithful as well in that last day. Go with us now, Father, through the remainder of this service. Help God and direct us and keep us always in your faith. This and many other blessings we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Turning to hymn books number 572 will be our next hymn this morning. 572. Send the light. We'll sing the first and last verse. There's a call coming
6.22. Tell me the story of Jesus as we prepare our minds for the taking of the Lord's Supper. We'll sing the first and last verse of 6.22. prepare our hearts and minds for the Lord's Supper. I want to read Mark 14, uh, verses 32. And he came to a place which was named Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit ye here while I shall pray. And he take with him Peter, James, and John, and he began to be sore amazed and very heavy. And he said unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful unto death. Tarry ye here and watch. Isaiah 53 records, Isaiah 53 and 11 says that the Lord saw the trail veil of his soul and it pleased him. In verse 35 he says, And he went forward a little, and he fell on the ground and he prayed that if it were possible that the hour may pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And he cometh and he findeth them sleeping. And he said unto Peter, Simon, And he, verse 37, he says, And he come and he findeth them sleeping. And he said unto Peter, Simon, sleepest thou? Couldest thou not watch one hour? 
Watch ye and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. The spirit truly is ready, but the flesh, it is weak. And again he went away, and he prayed, and he spake the same words. And when he returned, he found them sleeping again, for their eyes were heavy, neither wist they what to answer him. And he come a third time, and he said unto them, Sleep on now, take your rest, it is enough. The hour is come. Behold, the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Rise up, let us go. Lo, he that betrayeth me is at hand. In 1 Corinthians 11:23, 23, we read, For I have received of the Lord that which also I deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus the same night in which he was betrayed, and when he had, in which he was betrayed, he took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is a new testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat of this bread and ye drink of this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. So let him eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. I'm going to ask the men come forward at this time as we pray for the bread. Father and our God in heaven, we thank you for this hour that we have to remember your great sacrifice of your son who came to this world and he shed his life that we may have an opportunity to live with you eternally in peace. And Father, I pray that as we are about to take up this bread that we would do it in a manner, Father, that is pleasing and acceptable unto you. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let us pray for the cup. Father, again, we come, we 
are so mindful of the blood that was shed on Calvary Cross, the blood that continues to wash away our sins. Father, we thank you for this hour that we've come to remember this great sacrifice. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we have an opportunity to give back as we have prospered. In 1 Corinthians 16, it says, Now concerning the collection for the saints, as I have given orders to the churches of Galatia, even so do ye, upon the first day of the week, let every one of you lay by him in store as God has prospered him, that there be no gatherings when I come. And then also we read in Luke 6, 38, it says, Given it shall be given unto you, good measure, pressed down and shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom, for with the same measure you meet, with all it shall be measured unto you again. Of course, we know that God loves for us to give cheerfully, so let us go to God in prayer as we take up the collection. Our Father God, again, we thank you so much. We know, Father, that uh, we're not able, Father, to express our heartfelt gratitude. And Father, I pray that as we are about to give, Father, that we will give from the heart. Uh, realizing what sacrifices you have done for us by sending your son. Father, we pray that these collections will be gathered and used in a way, Father, that will can continue to uh, push the borders of thy kingdom into the worlds where it has not been reached. Father, these things we do ask in your son. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
At this time, please mark in your hymn books number 380. Number 380 will be our invitation song after Brother David Deckard's message this morning. 380. After you found that and marked it, please turn over a few pages to 391. 391. If it's convenient for you, would you please stand with me? This morning, our brother Dave Rogers is not with us. He's away with his family for the holiday. Our other minister, Brother David Gulledge, is with our kids in Alabama. So we have a, a blessing this morning. My other brother David is going to be able to speak to us this morning. Our brother David Decker needs no introduction to many of us here, but we do have a number of visitors with us this morning by way of introduction. Uh, David Decker is a the uh, director of the Georgia School of Preaching and Biblical Studies. He travels around the country encouraging and inspiring people to do God's will and learn. He's a great man of God. I know this because he studied the Word, he lives the Word, and he shares the Word. And we're blessed this morning to have him come share the Word with us, Brother Dave. Thank you so much, Brother Tom. That's so kind. Good morning. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, please turn back with me to the reading that Reggie did so beautifully earlier from Colossians 3. And that's going to be the text that we will use uh, in just a little bit for our study together. It is an honor to be pinch hitting today for your two all stars. Uh, I hope they enjoy their time away and doing what they're doing. And I'm honored to have this opportunity to stand in and speak. Appreciate the elders giving it to me. and. Hope we can say some things today that will be encouraging to every single one who is here. Happy New Year. If the world stands and we live, if Christ doesn't come sometime in the next 62 hours, we'll probably be saying that. And because of that, newness is in the forefront of our minds. This morning, we're going to look at the old life, but in contrast to that which is new. The year 2020 is the Chinese New Year of the Rat. Here's hoping the rats don't rule in 2020. But the new year has a lot of promise. Still not here yet. Has a lot of hope associated with it. And again, it has that moniker of being new. 
Sometimes it's easy to be cynical when we hear the word new, especially when it's attached to the word improved. You'll get a product on the shelves at the stores and it'll say new and improved. Well, you kind of like the old product. And sometimes our cynicism says, well, new and improved means you're going to be giving me less of it and charge me more for it. Maybe that's what it means. But when God talks about life, and God doesn't talk about the new year, He talks about the new life, especially in contrast to the old life. God isn't talking about something as, as esoteric and as, as surface as new car smell. For 10 bucks on the web, you can buy 16 ounces of new car smell, free shipping. And you know what? When you get through spraying that new car smell in that old car, you know what you're going to have? An old car. That's what you're going to have. But when someone is born again of the water and of the Spirit, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says that person is a new creation. And you and I should appreciate that because it's taken a lot on the part of God to purchase that opportunity for us to be genuinely, totally, and comprehensively new. And it's attractive for us to talk about that because when we think about this world, a lot is old and worn out. Before we go back to Colossians 3, let me share a passage of Scripture or two with you that really speaks to the issue of there being nothing new in this world, of a carnal material nature. Of course, Ecclesiastes 1, 9 and 10, Solomon says, That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done. And there's nothing new under the sun. Is there anything of which it may be said, See, this is new? It has already been in ancient times before us. Isaiah 51, 6, Isaiah says, Lift up your eyes to the heavens and look on the earth beneath. For the heavens will vanish like smoke, and the earth will grow old like a garment, and those who dwell in it will die in like manner. Strictly in terms of the physical, everything gets older. Everything does. Regardless of how much paint you put on it, Regardless of how much plastic the surgeon uses, some of those poor folks in Hollywood, you see their faces and they're so tight, you think you could put five strings on it and play dueling banjos. But what you have in the end of that is you still have an old face on an aging body. But if you're a Christian, 2 Corinthians 4.16 encourages us and says, though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And so with God, there is genuine renewal, not just a surface renewal, but from the inside out, comprehensive renewal. And our resolutions are not just New Year's resolutions. Every time we repent, every time we experience godly sorrow, 2 Corinthians 7, and we repent of sin, we're making a resolution not to go down that road again. And again, it's, it's not just a surface thing. It goes very deeply if we experience that godly sorrow, which moves us to the genuine resolution of, I'm, I'm going to try my very best not to do that again because I don't want to go back to the old life. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 2 or 22, Peter says that going back to the old life is like a dog returning to its vomit or a sow going back to wallow in the mire after she has been washed. So we want nothing to do anymore with the old life. We left that behind. But in order to appreciate and have a passion for the new life, for pursuing the things that we'll talk about tonight, Lord willing, at 5 p.m., it's good and healthy for us to go back and examine that old life that we left, to remind ourselves why we left it. 
and to remind ourselves of, of the unending resolve that we have never to go back to it. Because it has no promise, just like this old year that is coming to a close. There are maybe many things that we wanted to do 360 some odd days ago when 2019 was still a new year. But those promises haven't been realized. And the year has let us down. Well, the old life does the same thing. It lets us down because it is not of God. By its very nature, number one, it is of this world and not of the one to come. If you then were raised with Christ, Colossians 3, 1, seek those things which are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things, and there's the essence, the nature of the old life, not on things on the earth. The old life is all about this world. It's all about this body and this creature. It's all about the things that we can experience as we go through the three score and ten process of living in this world. Paul says if you're a Christian, that's not your focus anymore. Because that was the focus of your old life that you left behind, that you died to when you became a child of God. Listen to John, 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world, neither the things that are in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away. Just like this year, 2019 is passing away. And the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. Lust. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, pride. John says that's what the nature of this old life is all about. Paul adds to that in Romans chapter 8, verses 5 through 8. For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace because the carnal mind is enmity or hatred or variance against God. It is not subject to the law of God, nor indeed can be. So then those who are in the flesh cannot please God. So it's lust. It's pride. It's carnal thinking. A carnal mindset, a carnal viewpoint that says everything that I want, everything that I hold dear is of a physical, fleshly, this world nature. That's the old life. That's the old life that Paul talks about in Colossians 3. 1 Timothy 1 verse 13, Paul talked about his old life. Listen to what he says. Although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man. You know, when we read Paul's epistles, we don't get the idea that Paul was ever an insolent man. But that's what he remembered about his old life. But he says, I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. There's the other element. This old life is all about unbelief. A refusal to believe the things that God says in His Word a repudiation of those things, and an acceptance of what our adversary presents for us on a daily basis. We're saying, Satan, I like what's in your storefront better than God's if we focus on this old life. Because that's the nature, that's the very nature of it. Lust, pride, carnality, unbelief. And it's, it's a tired life. It's a tired old world, isn't it? Just like this year is tired and ready to go out. It's a tired life. 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8 said that when Lot looked at the ungodly behavior of those in Sodom around him, he was oppressed. Katapaneo, it made him tired. It made him weary. Well, that's what the old life's about. It grows weary. It's futile. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 2, 1 through 11, it's like grasping for the wind. He said, man, I, 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 I added to myself everything that you could possibly think of. We won't go through the list of those 11 verses, but at the end he makes the conclusion. He says, it's, it's like grasping for the wind. 
That's the nature. That's the nature of this life. And it's so sad to see folks give themselves to that. But it's even sadder to see a Christian try to live in both worlds. George Gallup of the famed Gallup Poll Organization, Statistical Analysis, Demographic Research, was addressing a large gathering one time of denominational folks. And his message to them was not, in some ways, encouraging. You probably would not have invited him back for, for a valedictorian graduation speech after he finished, because what he said was this. He said, folks, all the research that we do among churches and church-going people and non-church people, you know what it tells us? He says there's not a whole lot of difference between the two. He says there's a remarkable similarity in the immorality and ungodliness and, and materialism and lack of ethics and lack of spirituality. There's a remarkable similarity between those who go to church and those who don't. And then he said, eight out of ten folks, as far as their research was concerned, eight out of ten folks claim to be Christian. But five out of those ten cannot even tell you who preached the Sermon on the Mount. And two out of those ten say that they would never sacrifice for their religion. Ever. That's the old life. It's focused, it's cemented, it's, it's imprisoned by that old way of thinking and it finds its essence on the earth in this world. And its behavior, its behavior re reflects that. Let's go back to Colossians 3. And let's read together verses 3 through 5. Actually, it began in verse 2. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died... And your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you'll also appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death. The King James says mortify. It literally means put to death. It's like having a lynching or a firing squad. You're putting it to death. Your members which are on the earth, he says, and then he lists them. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. That's a very short list, but if you look elsewhere in Scripture, you'll find very similar lists, very similar catalogs of the same kind of behavior. 1 Peter chapter 4, 1 to 3, Paul, Peter says, We've spent enough of our past lifetime in doing the will of the Gentiles when we walked in lewdness, lusts, drunkenness, revelries, drinking parties, and that's some of what's going to take place on Tuesday night somewhere, I guarantee you, and abominable idolatries. Titus 3, 3, and 4, Paul says, We ourselves were also once foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving various lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5, Know this, that in the last days, that's the last dispensation of time, perilous times will come, for men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanderers without self-control, brutal, despisers of good, traitors, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. You know any folks like that? Most of us probably do. And, and maybe even some of us see some of that in ourselves. May God forbid. The old life has a catalog of behavior that is filled with foolishness and ungodliness and an absence of any kind of spiritual mindset. It, it, it sees people go out and behave like animals without ethic without any sense of propriety, and then once that behavior is engaged in, that same person will turn and try to justify what they do. Here's a quote from an actress that you'll recognize the name when I share it with you. She said, quote, I think it's fairly obvious why I've been married a few times. She said, I'm a very moral person. I was taught by my parents that if you fall in love rather than have a love affair... You get married. I guess I'm very old-fashioned. Those words were from Elizabeth Taylor. 
after her seventh marriage and divorce. You see, that's what this world does in reveling in its old life. It says, I'm living like a heathen and I'm enjoying every day. And I think I'm still a good person. Sad, but yes, even sadder when we see someone who is a Christian try to live the same way. You've probably heard the old story about the little boy in Bible class. The teacher was teaching about the rich man and Lazarus from Luke 16. She explained how the rich man fared sumptuously every day and how he had everything he ever wanted and how Lazarus was a beggar who ate the crumbs from the rich man's table and a dog licked his sores. And then she explained what happened to those two men at the end. And then she asked her class, she said, now class, which, which would you want to be, the rich man or Lazarus? The little boy raised his hand in the back and said, I want to be the rich man when I'm alive and Lazarus when I die. No. You can't play both sides of that song and come out in tune with God in the end. You see, the old life is a life that anybody can live. That's right. Anybody. It takes no courage, no conviction, no integrity, no restraint or self-control, no reverence for God, certainly no conscience, and no sense of godly sorrow or repentance. I saw a, a survey recently done in California, University of California, Los Angeles, among the male population of that giant school, over half of the young men attending UCLA, over half in this Barna Research Institute survey, over half of them said that they would gladly molest any young woman they met if they were certain that they would never get caught. And that would be the only reason they wouldn't. That's the old life. And sadly, that's a life that too many people in this world are living and that's why the gospel is still so needed for it to be preached and taught and lived before those in the world who are living this old life. Finally this morning, the outcome, and yes, there is an outcome to living this old life. Beginning in verse 6 in Colossians 3, Paul said, because of these things, because of the catalog of things we just read from verse 5, because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourself once walked when you lived in them. What's Paul saying to the church at Colossae? Remember your old life. Remember that old life. And remember when you were back in that old life, you were subject to the same eternal death sentence. Because, brethren, mark it down. Whether 2020 comes or not, the wrath of God is surely coming. It's surely coming as we got out of our beds and made our way to this place this morning. It's coming in flaming fire with Christ and His holy angels, 2 Thessalonians 1 and verse 7. It's coming upon the sons of disobedience. It's going to be revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, Romans 1 and verse 18. And those who do these things, those who live this life, they, they, are, they are asking for their own corruption. They're asking for their own destruction. Galatians 6, 7, and 8. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. They are asking to be cast in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death, Revelation 21, 8. They are asking for it. And if you and I are among their number, we're asking for it for ourselves. You see, it's appointed unto man once to die. Hebrews 9, 27. But the second death, Revelation 21, that's an option that we choose if we choose the old life. Is that old life worth living? <laughs> Not for any reason. Because the price that has to be paid is a very tall one. The old life is a dead-end street. It's an empty hole. It's more than that. It's a, it's a sinkhole that pulls us down and destroys the very essence of who we are made in the image of God. It's a bad deal. It's a wrong decision. 
It would be like placing our hope and our trust in the remaining days of 2019. Because this year's done. It really is. It's, it's really, really done almost. And if you're tired of the old life that you've been living this morning, maybe you're done with that too. And you want to put away the sin that you carry around every day in your heart and mind. There's only one way you can do that, through the blood of Christ, which will make you a new creation in the eyes of God. And you only get that by obeying the gospel, by confessing your belief in Jesus as the Son of God, by repenting of all sin, by putting Christ on in baptism and having those sins washed away. And, and rising, as we'll talk about tonight at five, rising to walk in newness of life. Not an old creature just rehashed, but a true, new, comprehensively new, spiritually new creation where there is no condemnation. Romans 8, verse 1. His name is Rod Matthews. In 1986, he was 14 years old. He was a high school student, state of Massachusetts. He was uninterested in sports, girls, music, cars. But one thing fascinated him, death. He watched all kinds of movies from the video rental store on death, one particular one called Faces of Death, which was a video, an actual real-time graphic video of actual deaths, people dying violently and savagely at the hands of other people. Oh, it fascinated him so much. He wanted to see it in real life. So on November 20th, 1986, he asked one of his friends from school to walk home with him that day through the woods. It was a shortcut between their two houses. And when they got in the woods, Rod Matthews took out a baseball bat and beat his friend to death and left his body there. Police found it three weeks later. During that three-week period, Rod Matthews brought friends of theirs, mutual friends to that place and showed them the body of his friend that he had killed. He was the first young man at age 14 to be sentenced to life in prison without parole. Three times now, the latest being 2016. He's gone before the parole board, state of Massachusetts, and been turned down to have his present sentence commuted. Brethren, if we choose the old life, hell will be our eternal place of torment. Don't make that choice today. The old life is not worth living. Christ came to deliver us from that. And it's the only thing that can that can affect that deliverance, the only thing being His blood. If we can encourage you this morning to obey the gospel, to be a Christian, to become a faithful Christian once again, if you've fallen away, would you come right now while together we stand and sing?
That was a powerful message that we just heard. And I'm sure it touched a lot of our lives, a lot of our hearts. And I'm sure there's many of us in this auditorium that have thought within themselves, I'm going to do better. But thank goodness for the forgiveness of our Father. We're blessed this morning. Our sister Janine Johnson comes. And she says, I come forward because I want to be forgiven of my sin. I'm a sinner, and I want the prayers of the church to help me be a better Christian. I don't think there's a single person in here that can't say that. We're honored and blessed. Let's pray with and for our sister. Let's pray together. Our Holy Father, we thank you for all that you do for us and all that you have done for us in giving the, the supreme sacrifice in that of your Son. We know that his blood continually cleanses us from all our sin if we only repent. Heavenly Father, we pray for our sister now as, as she lives this life this carnal life that we've talked about this morning, the old life. Father, help her to not hang on to it. Help her to live for that new life, that promise, that hope that you give. Help us as, he, as brothers and sisters to help her in that journey. Help each and every one of us to make that same commitment. Father, as we read in Psalm chapter 51, where David said, Create in me a clean heart. Father, we know that you can do that. You're faithful and just to forgive us. We pray, Heavenly Father, that as we leave this auditorium, we will all serve you better. It's in his name that we ask this prayer. Amen. Before we leave, we have a couple of announcements we'd like to make just to make sure that we know where we are going, where we need to be, when we need to be there. We need to be back here tonight at 5 o'clock to hear the rest of the story. We appreciate Brother David Decker coming and sharing that with us, so let's look forward to being back tonight. This week is a holiday week, so our midweek service will be on Tuesday night uh, instead of Wednesday night. So make sure we're here Tuesday night at 7 o'clock for our midweek service. Be prepared to stay afterwards to, to have a fellowship, to eat, and to play games, and let's ring in the new year. Can't think.